let me say a word in defense of reason in dialogue with faith. Because faith is that proof. Faith unites us to that substance. But reason, in order to realize its full potential, needs the horizons revealed by and truths contained in the faith. And not just any faith, but the Catholic faith. Thank you. The Garden of Eden was closed a long time ago. Now we're in the Garden of Gethsemane. My uncle, Bob Wolf, used to say, I'm all alone at the foot of the cross. I say, every day is Christmas, every day is Lent. In his book, The Long-Legged Home, Wendell Berry wrote, it is probably lucky for man that he was created last. <laughs> he would have got too excited and upset over all the change. <laughs> what did William Shakespeare's father say to William Shakespeare? Make plays. I traveled a long way to tell that joke. <laughs> My father's ancestors were thrown out of Scotland for being horse thieves. They fled to Ireland and were smart enough to marry Irish women. My great-great-grandfather, J.P. McCaskey, was a teacher and a principal for over 40 years at Boys High School in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. In 1867, he wrote the song, Jolly Old St. Nicholas. To each graduate of the school, he gave a portrait of himself with this inscription. The best of men that ever wore earth about him was a patient sufferer, a soft, meek, tranquil spirit, the first true gentleman that ever breathed. He wrote that about Jesus. He never even met Chris Ledyard. <laughs> after my great-great-grandfather had died, the school was renamed after him, McCaskey High School. My grandfather, George Hallis, started the Chicago Bears in 1920. He played on the team for 10 years. He coached the team for 40 years. He was the owner of the team for 62 years until he died in 1983 at the age of 88. He left the team to his family. We are trying to extend his legacy. That legacy has two parts, win championships and help other people. For the first six years of my parents' <coughs> marriage, I was not here. I only know the legend. Three wise men from the East, Bert Bell, Bill Lennox, and Art Rooney, <laughs> followed a bright star until they found my father at the University of Pennsylvania Theater. They approved of him, much to the despair of Chief Papa Bear. My mother's Indian name was Laughing Girl. My father put my mother on a donkey and they fled to Baltimore <laughs> and they got married. In lieu of money, they gave the donkey to the priest. <laughs> More than 10 months after the wedding, my brother Mike was born in Pennsylvania. He was wrapped in an army blanket and laid in an open footlocker. <laughs> Across the Atlantic Ocean, Hitler had captured much of Europe. My father had heard that Hitler's ultimate plan was the capture of Ireland. So my father defeated Hitler <laughs> with a sling and five smooth stones. <laughs> a 
Upon my father's return to Pennsylvania, he met my brother Tim, who cried and cried at the introduction. My sister Ellen was also born in Pennsylvania. When my mother was pregnant with me, the family moved to Illinois. Mary, Ned, Anne, George, Rich, Brian, and Joseph were also born in Illinois. True or false, Martin Luther King Jr. played quarterback for Morehouse College. True. True or false, his team was constantly penalized for delay of game because he kept making speeches in the huddle. <laughs> false. I started going to Chicago Bears games when I was five. My brothers and I sat on an army blanket next to the Bears bench while my grandfather coached. My grandfather once said to an official, no man is completely worthless. You can always serve as a horrible example. When I was in second grade at St. Mary's School in Des Plaines, Illinois, I was in Sister Amada's class. I was in the Bluebirds reading group. I used to enjoy getting up in front of the class and reading to my classmates. The teachers encouraged the students to be positive role models. They usually seated the students in alphabetical order. There were times when misbehaving students were seated next to students who behaved. Don Nevins often sat next to me. He is now an excellent priest. <laughs> when I was a junior at Notre Dame High School in Niles, Illinois, I failed the football physical because of a hernia. In the spring, on a sunny Sunday afternoon, I rode my bike 25 miles from Des Plaines to Wheaton to see Louise Raymond. She wasn't home. <laughs> the next day I had a half mile race. I didn't do very well. When I was a senior, I was quarterback on defense and offense. We were 9-0 and outscored our opponents 341-80. to There were no playoffs then. University of Notre Dame assistant coach Joe Yanto advised me to go to Cheshire Academy in Connecticut to get another year of playing experience. If I played well at Cheshire, then Notre Dame would seriously consider me for a scholarship. Coach Yanto wrote a letter about me to Steve Cook, the Cheshire varsity football coach. Based on that letter, Coach Cook designed a pro-style offense with me passing often. To prepare for the 1967 Cheshire football season, I ran the mile in 437.9, the day after the prom. <laughs> right before I left for Cheshire, my eye doctor, George Jessen, told me, no more contact sports. I felt like Marlon Brando in the movie On the Waterfront when he said, I could have been a contender. But when I arrived at Cheshire, an incident occurred that got me out of that mindset. I was standing in line at the bookstore one day before classes began. One student said to another student, we were going to have a great football team, but the quarterback had to give up football. The other student asked, what's his name? The first student replied, 
Jeb Swift, he hurt his knee. Then I saw a notice on a bulletin board about going off for cross country, so I did. One meet was against Choate in Stony Brook at Choate. I surprised the leader, Alan Swanson of Stony Brook, as I came from the back of the pack in the rain and passed him. Then he tried to pass me twice. We ended up tied for first at the finish line. At the social after the race, I found out that he had played quarterback, but he had to give up playing football because of a knee injury <laughs> from snow skiing. I placed fourth in the New England championship race and won a medal. I won the conference championship race on the track around the football field at halftime of the homecoming game. I had 13 races and I won nine while setting seven records. My nickname was Roadrunner. <laughs> I had my college board score sent to Indiana University, Miami of Ohio, and Ohio State. I was accepted at each of these schools. I was all set to go to Ohio State because that's where James Thurber went. The summer before college, I began working for Dr. Jessen. His son Mike and Mike's wife Karen had gone to Indiana University. Over the summer, they convinced me to go there too. I went there sight unseen. IU had an excellent optometry school and an excellent literature department. They were also the reigning Big Ten cross country champions. The 1968 IU cross country team had an A team and a B team. At the beginning of the season, I was the worst runner on the B team. The freshmen had meets at IU, Purdue, the University of Chicago, and IU. By the end of the season, I was the best runner on the B team. The highlight for me was running four miles at the University of Chicago under four minutes. After the season, I had to give up running for 10 years because of eye and allergy problems. During that period, my grandfather, Dr. Hallis, kept after me to seek medical solutions. He urged me to remain optimistic and to persist in trying to improve myself. In the fall of 1969, I was home from college because of eye problems. I worked part-time for Dr. Jessen, and I went to Loyola University, Chicago, part-time. In the spring of 1970, I returned to IU in McNutt Quad, which was a co-ed dorm. During the day, I would play the typewriter. <laughs> At night, I would go over to the ladies' side and read them my bedtime stories to help them sleep better. <laughs> I was an English major, but I really majored in James Thurber and E.B. White. I read their books and the articles about them in the wonderful library on 10th Street and Jordan Avenue at IU. In the summer of 1971, I had more eye and allergy problems. So I moved back into my parents' home and commuted to Loyola University of Chicago for two years. In the fall of 1971, instead of playing quarterback for the University of Notre Dame, I had an essay and a poem published in the Loyola University magazine, Cadence. The editor my first year had a running argument with the editor my second year about whether my essay or my poem was the best thing ever published in the magazine. I was noncommittal. <laughs> when I had gathered my strength, I went back to Indiana University for my final two semesters. I lived in Alpha Epsilon Phi sorority <laughs> with 70 ladies as their houseboy. 
During my first semester in the fall of 1973, my writing professor, Scott Sanders, suggested that I start my own humor publication. So I mimeographed my writings for the ladies. Each Thursday night after midnight, I put an essay or a poem in their mailboxes. During the second semester in the winter and spring of 1974, after I had found out that I was allergic to duplicating fluid, I performed collections of my writings on Friday evenings in the dining hall while the ladies were eating dessert. My oral presentation professor, Dr. Hawes, had each student choose a writer for the concert reading at the end of the semester. I chose me. <laughs> I did an essay, two fables, and two poems. I still have evaluation notes from my classmates and my teacher. I gave up living in a sorority to work for the Chicago Bears. Because of an allergy problems, it took me six years to complete my undergraduate classwork. My last class at IU was Thursday, June 20th, 1974. I started working full time for the Chicago Bears the following Monday. I went to the Bears training camp as the publicity assistant. My father introduced me to the Bears press corps and asked me, would you like to show these guys some of those poems you've been writing? I replied, not at this time. <laughs> the players later went on strike. <laughs> it was a great privilege to work with George Hallis on a day-to-day -day basis. There were no problems, only opportunities. One morning at the office, I was telling my uncle, Muggs Hallis, and my father, Ed McCaskey, that I had had speaking engagements the last three nights in a row. My grandfather happened to be walking by and overheard the conversation. He asked, where are you speaking tonight? I replied, I don't have a speaking engagement tonight. He said, that's too bad. In February 1977, he sent me a wonderful note. Long ago, I determined that work exceeds talent work every day, by writing every day, make me even more proud than I am of you, love George. During Easter week of 1977, the television movie Jesus of Nazareth was aired. For Easter Sunday dinner, I drove my grandfather to my parents' home. After dinner, I suggested that we watch the final installment of Jesus of Nazareth. After the program, Grandpa said to me, thank you for having us watch that. One day my grandfather called me into his office. He said, get a master's degree. I asked, will you pay for it? <laughs> he said, yes. It was a very short meeting. <laughs> During the off seasons, I went at night to DePaul University. I earned a master's degree in the interdisciplinary studies of business, writing, and performing. Frequently, Grandpa and I had dinner together after work. When a Bears fan would stop by our table to ask for an autograph, he would always comply. He loved the Bears and appreciated any sign that a fan did, too. For family dinners, after my grandmother had died, I often drove him out to my parents' home in Des Plaines. He asked me about my girlfriends, and I asked him about his. <laughs> we had no conflicts because he never dated anyone under the age of 48. When Grandpa received the Sword of Loyola in 1979, he said, Sixty years ago, I offered my heart and my helmet to the Lord. My heart is still beating and my helmet still fits. 
I pray the divine coach finds me worthy to be on his first team. In 1980, the Bears had a half mile run to start training camp. After I had finished eighth, my grandfather was very angry at me because I didn't win. In 1981, the Bears had a half mile run to start training camp. One player, Chris Haynes, finished ahead of me. He was later cut. In 1982, on my 33rd birthday, I received a promotion. My uncle, Jim McCaskey, called me and gave me permission to date. <laughs> he taught me to say, all that I am, all that I hope to be, is because of my uncle Jim. After I had finished first on my second attempt in the 1982 one and a half mile Ditka Derby, Walter Payton said to me, I tried to stay with you. Then I said, that boy is crazy. <laughs> that made all the training worthwhile. The players later went on strike. <laughs> At the suggestion of Mrs. Swider, I met Gretchen Wagel on Super Bowl Sunday, 1983, through mutual friends, the Bradleys and the Swiders. On Saturday of Memorial Day weekend, Gretchen and I looked at a house that was for sale. After the tour, Gretchen asked me, why are you looking for a house? I crossed my mouth with the back of my hand and muttered, in case you want to get married. <laughs> She accepted my invitation. <laughs> On Memorial Day, my mother asked me, why are you looking for a house? My mother and my wife are a lot alike. I replied, because Gretchen and I are talking about getting married. When my mother stopped crying with joy, she asked me, how old is she anyway? I replied, she's 30. She only looks 18. <laughs> My mother gave us her mother's wedding ring. This was a great surprise, a marvelous delight, and an outward sign that she approved of the idea. On June 26, the anniversary of Grandma Min's birthday, Gretchen and I called on Grandpa. He was convalescing and looking frail for the first time in his life. He had purchased the ring I was giving Gretchen over 60 years ago for Grandma Min. He said, I bought it for $250 in a pawn shop. I wanted to make sure it was over a carat, and yet I wouldn't have paid $750 for it. <laughs> At our wedding rehearsal on Friday, March 2nd, my father held a huge urn in his left hand and a large Bible in his right hand. Then he walked up to the choir loft, faced all of us and said, I approve of this marriage. <laughs> when Gretchen and I married each other, we wanted it to be a good witness. Christ was the center of the ceremony. As I stood before Father Nevins and Pastor Gordon, I thought, this is how it's going to be on the day of judgment. I better be a loving husband. When we were on our honeymoon, after I told a joke, I quoted Jimmy Durandy and said, I got a million of them. <laughs> Gretchen replied, I wish you only had a thousand. <laughs> During the 1985 season, Gretchen and I were trying to get pregnant. When we were unsuccessful, I knew it wasn't my fault. 
So we had my wife checked. <laughs> she had an ovarian cyst. On Monday, December 2nd, the Bears played the Miami Dolphins in Miami. The Bears lost 38 to 24. That was our only defeat. The next morning, the cyst was removed. We could try again to get pregnant after the Super Bowl. For our game preparation, we camped on the Mississippi River near the Mark Twain Courtyard. Many of us visited Bourbon Street where there was a great need for missionary work. <laughs> on our walks we sang, What a friend we have in Jesus. When I came into the locker room before one practice, Walter Payton told one of the security guards to check me out. He did, and everyone involved had a good laugh. <laughs> when I met Jim McMahon's father the day before the Super Bowl, I said to him, you should have given Jim more spankings. He replied, I know. <laughs> Before every home game, Father Morrow said Mass for us. He was also in New Orleans to say Mass for us. We had Mass on Saturday and Sunday. I had the privilege of being the lector at both Masses. The epistle was 1 Corinthians Chapter 12, verses 12 through 30. In his homily, Father Morrow described this passage as a Super Bowl sermon. It is about how everyone is important to the body of Christ, the team. The body is one and has many members, but all the members, many though they are, are one body, and so it is with Christ. Throughout the season, and particularly in the week before the game, everyone in the Bears organization, management, coaches, and players, contributed to the championship. The players who made the Pro Bowl had to leave New Orleans for Hawaii early the next morning. They were not able to attend the downtown Chicago ticker tape parade that reminded me of all the confetti that was thrown after the wedding of Grace Kelly and Prince Rainier. Perhaps St. Paul offers the appropriate comment after the previously mentioned epistle. We honor the members we consider less honorable by clothing them with greater care, thus bestowing on the less presentable a propriety which the more presentable already have. Exactly nine months after the Bears' victory in Super Bowl XX, my wife Gretchen and I were blessed with a son, Ed. He reported two days early. We felt that showed good initiative. <laughs> he was born Sunday, October 26, 1986, right before Kevin Butler kicked a field goal against the Detroit Lions at Soldier Field. The Bears won 13 to seven. We watched the game in the birthing room. If I die before my wife does, I hope that she gets married again, but I don't want my successor to wear my Super Bowl ring. That goes to my son, Tom. Ed received my father's Super Bowl ring when he graduated from college. All of you are witnesses. <laughs> On Tuesday, September 9, 1987, we moved into our home. The players later went on strike. <laughs> On many September 9ths at 6.30 p.m., we changed the net on our basketball hoop. All of you are invited. <laughs> We'd like to show you our wedding book. I also have some of my high school football games on video. 
on Thursday, November 25th, 1993, Thanksgiving. The Bears beat the Lions 10 to 6 in Pontiac, Michigan. My Super Bowl ring was stolen. We were not home at the time, but we were embarrassed because the house was messy. <laughs> Thanks to great police work, we got the ring back a few days later. None of you were suspects. <laughs> a reading of a letter that I have written. Dear baby, we are four championships behind the Green Bay Packers, so please don't dawdle too long. We need your help. We want to win championships with sportsmanship. We do good works quietly for God's glory. We fear God and we respect our opponents. We are trying to keep the Bears going until the second coming. <laughs> we work diligently and we trust God for the results. Like the Magi who followed the great star, we go forward in faith. We are grateful for at least the following. God created a wonderful world in six days. Jesus died for our sins, including fumbles. <laughs> when we need the Holy Spirit, He is there. He is even there when we think that we don't need Him. We are hopeful that the world will not end until the Bears have the most championships. <laughs> Instead of the Super Bowl most valuable player saying that he's going to Disney World, he could say that he's going to church or mosque or temple. After the presentation of the trophy, the second coming would be a great post-game show. <laughs> we want to play our games with cooperation that is like an Amish barn raising. We go to church and Bible study and have daily devotions. Our mandate is to love God and each other. In our attempts to love, we are often funny. Hallis Hall is a place of work and not a den of thieves. It is a halfway house to heaven. Instead of saying, please be quiet, we say, please become a mime. <laughs> we give away the credit and we take the blame. We criticize privately and we praise publicly. Instead of singing as soloists, we sing as a chorus. We provide accountability and positive reinforcement for each other. From William Bennett's book, The Moral Compass, we know that Goethe once said that you must labor to possess what you have inherited. If we are not grateful for our gifts and opportunities, we are not likely to value them. And if we do not value them, we are not likely to preserve and improve them. If you know some people who are not Bear fans, don't be discouraged. <laughs> some of the greatest Christians started out as atheists. <laughs> Jesus forgave the good thief. All they have to do is repent. When my sons were in seventh and eighth grade, I was one of their football coaches. Tommy Reese was one of our quarterbacks. Now he plays quarterback for the University of Notre Dame. I have given him a post-game quote that he hasn't used yet. I'd like him to say, I was very well coached in junior high. <laughs> I taught him what Bill Wade taught me, footwork and follow through. I also taught him to be a servant leader like Jesus who washed the feet of his apostles. I think the worst thing I ever yelled at an official was, Jesus died for your sins. <laughs> when my sons were high school seniors, I wrote each of them this letter when they were on their senior retreats. Dear son, when I was a high school freshman, 
I was barking out the signals as quarterback, and my voice cracked. I said, Rene! Sit! <laughs> when I was a sophomore, I started two games at end, five games at halfback, and two games at fullback. Then I didn't have to call signals. When I was a junior, I failed the football physical because of a hernia. My voice cracked that day. <laughs> when I was a senior, I was quarterback on defense and offense. My voice did not crack. Now you are a high school senior, and you are on your senior retreat. You are a very good student. You are on your way to a faith-based college where you can get an excellent education. Most importantly, let's hope you're on your way to heaven. Regardless of where you go to college, let's keep the ultimate goal in mind. We're interested in schools that emphasize faith, education, and sports. We want to win championships with sportsmanship, and we want to get to heaven. I'll be with you at the Family Retreat Mass. It's important to grow physically, socially, culturally, and spiritually. Physically, you are a very good athlete. Socially, you are a very good family member and a very good friend. Culturally, you are doing very well in school. Spiritually, you go to church and you exhibit sportsmanship. I want you to continue to be a servant leader like Jesus who washed the feet of his apostles. You are one of my three beloved sons in whom I am well pleased. <laughs> Jesus is my role model and I hope and trust that he is yours. Regardless of what others do, we need to do what is right. We have God's grace and mercy that provides strength. Church and Bible study and daily devotions keep us on the right path. Your mother and I are praying that you will continue to grow in the Lord. If you are not called to the priesthood, I hope that you will marry a follower of Jesus, someone like your mother. I enjoy being with you. You are very good company. Pride is a sin, so I don't say that I'm proud of you. I am very grateful that you are my son. Thank you. I love you. It's great to be with you, your earthly father. After the Bears had qualified for Super Bowl 41, I was tempted to call my former girlfriends and say, if you had married me, <laughs> you could have gone to the Super Bowl. And then I remember that after Jesus rose from the dead, he didn't taunt the people who had rejected him. <laughs> when I started working for the Bears, my hair was brown, curly, and thick. Now my hair is white, straight and thin. God is protecting my marriage. I was too good looking. <laughs> I've had the good fortune to be associated with the Bears all my life. In the process, I've learned how to appreciate it and cope with it. The football business is an emotional roller coaster. God is constant. Since I am Catholic, I attend St. Mary's Church in Lake Forest. Because my wife Gretchen is Protestant, I escort her to Christ Church in Lake Forest. As a result of going to both churches, I have a more abundant life. It's good to get a second opinion. <laughs> Catholic homilies are short. Protestant sermons are long. Catholics sing one or two verses of a hymn. Protestants sing every verse two or three times. <laughs> Protestants have excellent children's nurseries. 
Gretchen and I are also active in Bible studies. You may have read about my wife in Proverbs 31. <laughs> Verses 10 through 31 describe the ideal wife. When I need a break from my wife's efforts to improve me, I say, that's enough reformation for a while. Her only fault is that she tells me how to drive. After she apologizes to me, I say, that's all right, that's okay, we'll stay married anyway. <laughs> I sort of have two wives, Gretchen and the navigation lady. <laughs> there are 1,328 chapters in the Bible. If we read 26 Bible chapters a week, we can read the Bible in 51 weeks and have a week off for Christmas break. We can use that week to write thank you notes for our Christmas gifts. All year long, I encourage people to live the gospel and be generous. Then at Christmas, I make a profit. <laughs> My Christmas goal is to receive more than I give. When we need to know the truth, we need to read the Bible. We can read the newspapers for information. We can read the Bible for inspiration. The example of the Israelites who kept the faith while they wandered in the desert before they reached the promised land helps me get through the tough Illinois winters. As one out of many bears and heritors, I have prayerfully considered the future of the team. Here's what I have discerned. George Hallis was my grandfather, and that's a great legacy. I work for the Bears, and that's a great opportunity. I have it made because Christ died for my sins, which we don't have time to discuss right now. <laughs> I believe that God has a plan for everyone and for every family. We have the freedom to be obedient. I think that God's plan for me is to work for the bears. I choose to be obedient. God gave me faith, a wonderful family, and a great legacy. As a mature Boy Scout, I feel prepared. <laughs> I hope that we never sell the team, even though that would give us a lot of money. Satan offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. The Waltons never sold Walton's Mountain. From Robert Pinsky's essay, Responsibilities of the Poet, we know this. So one great task we have to answer for is the keeping of an art that we did not invent, but were given, so that others who come after us can have it if they want it, as free to choose it and change it as we have been. The same responsibility applies to our bear's legacy. With God's faith, I try to be obedient to his plan for my life. With God's hope, I try to be a voice of encouragement. With God's love, I try to exemplify Jesus. There was a series of books called Vision Books. They are about saints and other wonderful people. My mother gave us these books for ourselves and for our friends when we are invited to their birthday parties. My two favorite books in this series were Champions in Sports and Spirit and More Champions in Sports <laughs> and Spirit. The first book was about Yogi Berra, baseball, Terry Brennan, football, Maureen Connolly, tennis, Bob Cousy, basketball, Gil Hodges, baseball, Rocky Marciano, boxing, and Eddie 
our, uh, and Maurice Richard, hockey. The second book was about Eddie R. Carroll, horse racing, Carmen Basilio, boxing, Jean Bellevue, hockey, Ron Delaney, track, Juan Manuel Fangio, auto racing, Stan Musial, baseball, Alex Almeida, tennis, and Herb Score, baseball. Ed Fitzgerald wrote both books. Regardless of what happens on the field, let's behave like champions in sports and spirit. Let's not analyze, let's not denigrate, let's not second guess. Let's not diagnose injuries before we've read the x-rays. Let sportsmanship prevail. John Wooden used to say, win with humility, lose with grace. Here's something from Seamus Haney. Never resting upon the oars of success or in the doldrums of disappointment. Sports Faith International showcases the connection between sports and faith. It recognizes people who are successful in sports while leading exemplary lives. We recognize professionals, Olympians, college and high school athletes, coaches, and teams. Franciscan University is one of our sponsors. We are not called to walk on water or change water into wine or multiply loaves and fishes or raise the dead or be scourged at the pillar or walk to Calvary with a cross on which to be crucified. We are not called to do what is impossible for us. Christ performed all of those heavenly deeds at a three-year pace. It is for us to follow in his steps, live for righteousness without being self-righteous. In relation to the parable of the prodigal son, I have been the younger son. I have been rebellious. I have been the older son. I have been resentful. Now my goal is to be the father, forgive others as I have been forgiven. Bitterness is spiritual cancer. Forgiveness is spiritual rapture. Weather is a reminder that God is the boss. The Spirit strengthens us even after a loss. Jesus Christ is the man, salvation is the plan. <laughs> when we dance God's dance, He gives us another chance. God's work is efficient, His food is sufficient. Here's a part of my prayers, bear down Chicago Bears. With my wife's permission, I contacted some former girlfriends and asked them if they had heard from David Marinus. He wrote a book about the ladies in the life of Barack Obama before he met his wife, Michelle. In case David Marinus writes about a, a book about me because I was president of my eighth grade class, I hope my apologies are up to date. <laughs> the Ten Commandments of Football. One, football is a wonderful game. There's blocking and tackling and much, much more. Be enthusiastic. Two, weddings, births, and vacations should take place during the off seasons. <laughs> Three. Remember the Hupmobile in the original meeting. Four, all previous games are preparation for the next one. Five, obey the personal conduct policy. Six, work for the good of the league. Seven, win championships with sportsmanship. Eight, you shall not criticize the officials. Nine, you shall not covet other teams, coaches, or players. <laughs> 
10, gain times are tentative and subject to flexible scheduling. <laughs> if the apostles had played football, they would have been a great team. Peter would have been the quarterback. Andrew was Peter's brother. They would have been used to playing catch in the yard. Let's put Andrew at end. James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John were known as the sons of thunder. So they would have been the backs. We don't know much about Philip, Bartholomew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, and Simon the Cananean. So they would have been the linemen. <laughs> Doubting Thomas would always be encouraging his teammates to play harder. Let's put him at middle linebacker. <laughs> if Mike Singletary had been an apostle, the other apostles wouldn't have slept in the Garden of Gethsemane. <laughs> Matthew, the tax collector, was used to dealing with money. Let's put him at end like George Hallis. Matthias, who replaced Judas, would have been the kicker. <laughs> the apostles would have been excellent on special teams. Paul would have been the writer, like me. He wrote a lot of letters, even though the Corinthians were the only ones who ever wrote back. <laughs> Before the Bears play a game, mass and chapel service are available in the team hotel. We try to get the Pope because we think our games are important. <laughs> we offer $100 and two tickets. Chuck Simpson said, he probably doesn't know who to bring. <laughs> in his book, God in Action, How Faith in God Can Address the Challenges of the World, Cardinal George calls on us to rely on and cooperate with the providence of God. He also wrote, God is at work where charity and self-sacrifice and forgiveness unite people who would otherwise be separated, where good consequences overcome evil actions, where hope remains constant in the midst of despair, where new life comes from death. When the Bears are in the Super Bowl, Cardinal George will say Mass for us. He will talk with the Pope. If the Pope is available, they will con celebrate. <laughs> when I think about Franciscan University, I hear my father, Ed McCaskey, sing Bear Down Chicago Bears, and I rewrite the lyrics. Thank you, Franciscan you, for being so passionately Catholic. Thank you, Franciscan you, for your academic excellence. <laughs> we'll never forget Father Terence Henry. He is the school president. Thank you, Franciscan you. Your life serves as a witness to the world. You spur your minds to enlightenment. Franciscan you, thank you, 